Oh god, here we go again. Am I ever going to get away from the Ninja 400? Every time we posted a video about our giveaway Ninja 400, we always got at least a dozen comments from you baby squids, all eager to remind me that I wasn't allowed to like the Ninja 400, because back in 2018, I made a video where I called it Premium Mediocre. Interestingly enough, people gave me less grief when I called it a perfect toilet in our comprehensive breakdown video. I'm also convinced this is where the myth that I hate cowies comes from. I'm sure that even if I changed my name to Cowie Noob and espoused the virtues of the ZX-14R from the summit of Mount Olympus, people would still ask me why I hate the Ninja 400 so much. Oh well, let's assume for a minute that you haven't been a loyal Yamcolite watching our content like a good boy forever and start out fresh. Hi, hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Yammy Noob and I ride a Busa. I talk about motorcycles and ball shavers on the internet. No doubt you have found this video because you are a fresh-faced young squid looking to get your little tentacles on your first motorcycle. Hmm, that's a weird way to say that. Anyway, you've spent days on YouTube and one motorcycle keeps coming up as the best beginner bike that you could buy and it's the SV650. Just kidding, it's the Ninja 400. The Little Ninja is the final form of the beginner bike that first rolled out from the factory back in the 80s, which is more pedigree than most bikes in the class. Today we're going to break down everything you need to know about the Ninja 400, and if you're here just to see if the Ninja 400 is good on the highway, let me answer that question right now. Yes, it is. But before we jump in, today's video is brought to you by Rockform. They're a new partner for the channel, and they make the best case and phone mount combo for your bike. But yummy, I've already got a phone mount on my bike. No. Ditch it, it's garbage. Not only are those other mounts bulky and get in the way when you ride, but if you swap the case on your phone, you better pray to Rossi it fits, otherwise you're gonna have to go buy another mount. But with Rockform, you get all of that in one nice, neat package. The case has a dual-layer multi-compound design that is tested from six feet, which means you can drop it from almost one spite, and your phone will be in one piece. It's also got a phone-safe magnet in there, so you can slap your phone in the gas tank and watch this video while cleaning your chain. You get a handlebar mount made of CNC'd aircraft-grade aluminum that'll keep your phone from kissing asphalt when you're dragging knee out on the street, which you probably shouldn't be doing, like a normal person. And right now, if you click the link down below and use the code YN25, that's YN25, you can get 25% off of your whole order. So go and check out Rockform. I'm very thankful for them for supporting the channel and the series. Now let's jump in. So where did the Ninja 400 come from? Well, it all began way back in 1983 with a little bike called the GPZ 250. Now, you might recognize the GPZ from the cult classic GPZ 900R the Tom Cruise rode in Top Gun. But its baby brother was this absolutely wretched little 250. It featured a 248cc parallel twin making 33 horsepower, but since it didn't make it to the states, we don't count it. In 1986, Kawasaki sought fit to give us the EX250E, still known as the GPZ250 in other parts of the world, but here in the states it was the Ninja 250R. When it came out, it was considered the sporty alternative to the Honda Rebel. The Little Ninja featured a 248cc parallel twin, cranking out 37.4 horsepower. It had a red line of 14,000 RPM, which really isn't too bad. It weighed in at 344 pounds and could do a quarter mile in 15.4. As much fun as people had bouncing this little engine off that sky-high red line, it was bemoaned for how slowly it revved up. This bike looked kind of like the half-fairing SV650, but with a square headlight and a chunky tail that is very much the calling card of an 80s motorcycle. But then in 1988, Kawasaki made THE Ninja 250. This is the bike that you see on Craigslist for a thousand bucks, and this is the bike your buddy was talking about when he said he started on a Ninja 250, so what changed over the previous model? Well, a lot actually. While it was the same 248cc parallel twin, it made 37.4 horsepower and 18 foot-pounds of torque. It went from 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds. It could complete a quarter mile in 14.5. Sure, this wasn't a massive improvement over the performance of the last model, but Cowie bumped the compression from 12 to 1 to 12.4 to 1. The rear sprocket gained an extra three teeth and the carb shrank two millimeter. All of this made for a bike that reached that same 14,000 RPM much faster and made the bike actually fun to ride. They also gave the bike a cosmetic overhaul from some of the half fairing monstrosity to a stylish fully fared bike that could have easily been mistaken for the Ninja 750. This bike sold like hotcakes and became the de facto answer to the question, what should my first bike be? They made three versions of this bike, but the EX250F is the real Ninja 250. Kawasaki sold this bike from 1988 to 2007 with virtually no changes, and for damn near 20 years, the Ninja 250 was the beginner bike. You'll still see them from time to time running around town as beater track bikes and, of course, as Craigslist parts bikes. But by 2008, the motorcycle public found the 1980s aesthetic of a Ninja 250 to be woefully out of date. So Kawasaki gave the world the EX250J with the 249cc parallel twin that was slower, heavier, and more expensive. Wow, Kawasaki, so brave, so bold. 
This is the problem with being on top for so long, you get complacent. I mean, in 2007, Harley-Davidson switched all their bikes over to fuel injection, and when Harley can dunk on you, you know you messed up. This bike ran for four years and had a design update in the last year to give it fuel injection in some markets, but at that point, the Ninja 250 had gone from being a darling to being that one weird kid who likes off-brand soda and picks his nose in class. Then in 2012, the Ninja saw a bump in displacement from 249cc to 296cc, and the Ninja 300 was born. The Parallel Twin made almost 40 horsepower and 13.6 foot-pounds of torque. It wasn't significantly faster from 0 to 60 in 5.6 seconds, and clearing the quarter mile in 14.5, but it did feature ABS and no more would beginners have to battle with carburetors, which is a big deal, just ask spite. And yes, I do hate carbs, don't at me. However, by 2015, the beginner bike market was really starting to take off. The CBR300R was more widely available, and Yamaha just dropped the stylish new R3 with a Cheater 321cc engine that rocketed to prominence thanks to a certain YouTuber. Now, I'm not saying I'm single-handedly responsible for the success of the R3, but come on, Yamaha, where's my check? So, how do you make one 300 stand out in a sea of other 300s? Well, you don't. You bump the displacement, create your own category to compete in, and that's exactly what Kawasaki did. In 2018, they bumped the Ninja's displacement to 399ccs and gave the world a small displacement spork bike you could actually be proud to own. In keeping with the rest of the ZX line of motorcycles, it featured aggressive lines and sharp edges, and were it not for the big ol' 400 stamped on the side of it, you could be forgiven for thinking it was a bigger bike. Or at least you would until you had to straighten, had to crack open the throttle, and you would be reminded that it was a tad bit slow. The new Ninja 400 makes 43.3 horsepower and 28 foot-pounds of torque, which is more than enough to scoot you onto the office, down a back road, or around a track if you feel so inclined. It can be had for as low as 49999, that's too many nines, 4999 without ABS, but if you ask me, ABS is worth, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> oh. if you ask me, the ABS is worth the extra 300 bucks. So. Which Ninja is right for you? Obviously, I would recommend you get the newest model, if only because it's so cheap, but if you had to go with an older model, you should look at the Ninja 300. You'd be buying a bike that's almost as fast, almost as torquey, and still looks like a modern sport bike. You'd also be getting a fuel-injected bike, but what are some issues you might run into if you decide to pick up one of these bikes? Well, the first gen Ninja being the 1988 to 2007 model years is fairly bulletproof. It's a simple engine made even simpler with the addition of carburetors. The main complaints are that it takes a long time for the bike to reach its operating temperatures, the oil light comes on during heavy braking, and the gas tank whines after a ride. The biggest issue is a knock that comes from the clutch basket. Normally nothing is wrong since the Ninja 250 is a loud motorcycle, but sometimes the plastic bumpers in the clutch wear out and cause the stop in which causes an unsettling amount of noise to come from the bike. Another obvious problem is the carbs which will need constant maintenance to keep running well. There doesn't appear to be a fatal flaw with these bikes, which is why you probably see so many sky-high mileage Ninja 250s. The Ninja 300 on the other hand was not so well built. The early Ninja 300 suffered from an ECU problem that would cause the the bike to die when you pulled in the clutch. Nice. Kawasaki issued a recall on those bikes and claimed the issue was resolved in 2014, but unless you can verify the service records, I would steer clear of the 2013 Ninja 300s. Unfortunately, killing the bike by using the clutch wasn't the only glaring issue with these bikes. The ABS and brackets on the front wheel can get in the way of the front brake caliper, and the bracket on the swing arm would do the same to the rear brake. This would cause the brake pad to not contact the rotors properly, reducing braking performance and possibly damaging the rotors. There was another recall for this issue, but again, without service records, it's tough to know if you're buying the bike that has an issue solved. The newer Ninja 400 has solved a lot of these issues, but according to Rider Forum, some people have reported problems with the gearbox. They've had hard times shifting, reported false neutrals between 5th and 6th, and in severe cases, they can't even get the bike into gear. Now, from first-hand experience, I can say we didn't encounter any of these experiences or issues with our giveaway Ninja 400, so it's possible that the gearbox needs some breaking in. So guys, the Ninja 400 is a great motorcycle and an excellent beginner bike. It can handle everything you throw at it, even if it doesn't wow you with performance. Should you find yourself in the saddle of a Ninja 400, you're in for plenty of smiles per gallon, but what do you think? Is there anything that we got wrong? Let me know down below, and while you're down there, don't forget to check out Rock Forum for the latest phone case you'll ever need. As always, I need to shout out all of our support supporters on yamenoob.co for helping us make all of this possible. So if you like what we do, you want to win some free motorcycles, click that link down below and who knows, you might even win it. I'll catch you guys in the next one. See you later. Fact, animals that lay eggs do not have belly buttons. Goodbye.